Ever look at a piece of public art in the community and wonder how it got there? Whose idea it was? Who made it? Who paid for it? When people drive by a piece of public art, they're seeing the final product. They're seeing um, what they perceive as one artist's work out in the public. But really, there's so much behind a single piece of public art. So much indeed. In fact, by the time people see public art living in the public realm, it's been through an incredible journey, a journey that starts with a single idea. This project came about because uh, National Dance Institute approached us about doing a public art piece in front of the building. We are here celebrating the dedication of Reels and Wheels, which is a public art sculpture and bus shelter here in front of the Highland Theater. Wait a minute, did she say a public art piece and a bus shelter? How'd that happen? Originally, this was just going to be a piece of public art in front of the Highland Theater. Albuquerque Ride was going to put a standard issue bus shelter in front of the building as well. When the Arts Board found out about this, they were interested in partnering with Albuquerque Ride to do a combination bus shelter and sculpture together. Okay, I get it. It was a collaboration between the city of Albuquerque's transit system, ABQ Ride, who contributed $20,000 to the project, and Bernalillo County, which owns the old Highland Theater, which is now home to NDI, the National Dance Institute. But does that mean anybody can make a request to have a piece of public art in front of their building? How does that work? Whenever a bond is approved, 1% of that is set aside for the acquisition of public art. For example, with the Highland Theater Project, that is a county-owned facility, and 1% of the bond funds used to purchase and renovate that building were um, set aside for a public art project. Starting to see the bigger picture here. Actually, this picture might help. Remember that arts board that was mentioned a minute ago? Well, it really does exist. 10 people like you and me who live in Bernalillo County and serve on a board that oversees how county funds are spent on the art that beautifies our community. When thinking about NDI's request for a piece of public art, the Arts Board took into consideration not just the current status of the area, but also the history of that stretch of Central Avenue. And they took all of that information and crafted a call, a call for artists. When the Arts Board crafted the call for artists, they focused on a few key elements. One was the sense of movement, and that could relate to dance and movement in, within the facility, but it's also about the movement of people on this historic road through, you know, it's, it's a car culture that was established around, um, around the time in the 1950s when, when Route 66 was, was starting to be in its heyday. They thought, let's do a call that really focuses on that, um, the history and, and the, the mo of the mother road. That call for artists went out online, on websites, in newspapers, and by word of mouth to any and all interested artists who lived in Route 66 states. 63 artists submitted proposals for the Reels and Wheels project, which brings us to the next piece in the picture. From there, the Arts Board with NDI and local representatives, including neighbors and local business owners, um, selected three finalists. After sifting through more than 60 artist proposals, the Bertolio County Public Arts Board narrowed the scope to three. Interestingly, the name of the artist who was ultimately selected to do the project was not on that original list. And then I um, got a letter back telling me I wasn't, ex I wasn't accepted. They'd say, pick somebody else. They'd pick three finalists. And I thought, that's the end of that. You know, I just like a lot of times you just go back to your man cave and try and figure out another way to go on the next project. So. <laughs> I did call him in and ask her, you know, where I was in the place. And I'd never talked to him before. And he called and he said, boy, I really thought I'd gotten that, that project. I, my friends told me that I was going to win that one. And I was certain that this was one that I was going to do. And I told him, I'm sorry, you know, you weren't selected as one of the three finalists. And I wished him luck. And, um, and then a few days later, I heard from one of the finalists that, that he wasn't going to be able to participate in that those three. So um, he stepped down and then that runner-up was Howard Meehan. One person that dropped out couldn't build a project for the for the budget. So she asked me if I'd be willing to come in and, and accept, be one of the finalists. So I did. Yeah, I was very pleased about that. Yeah. 
you get a second chance. Not too often you get that in these things. Those three finalists, which now included Santa Fe artist Howard Meehan, had to then go before the Arts Board with their proposals. He got to present his idea and we had, it was on a Saturday, and we had those three finalists individually present their, their design and uh, the Arts Board and the neighborhood representatives asked questions and had a dialogue about each project and, and Howard's, um, they were very compelled by his, by his project and how specific it was to Route 66 and the Highland Theater. And it really resonated with what the Arts Board was looking for, which was acknowledging the, the, and referencing the Mother Road, also addressing lighting, which was important because there's all this neon along the road, and, um, and then the sense of movement. And after all that scrutiny and attention, there was one more critical step in the approval process. The next step in the process is that all decisions, all recommendations that are made by the County Arts Board then need to go in front of the County Commission for approval. At that meeting we had Howard Nehan, we had representatives from Albuquerque Ride, and myself present the concept for the project to the County Commission. And he, we showed the maquette, the scaled model, and some drawings, and the, uh, the Commission unanimously approved the project. And this is where the real work begins, which brings us to the other half of the picture, the part where artist Howard Meehan is selected, and now he goes from the idea and proposal stage of the project to actually making it happen. And then you have to put together a whole budget for this whole project. You got to figure out what to, what's going to cost to build it, to fabricate it, to install it. Fortunately, this wasn't Howard's first rodeo when it came to public art projects. So I've been doing public art work for some 20-something years and have been through a lot of my own dedications and the work the cities and across the country, and this is probably the most profound one I've worked on. Profound largely because it reminded Howard of a very impressionable time in his life, his very first encounter with the Mother Road back in the 60s. My first experience with Route 66 was out of college, I went to work for Ford Motor Company as an automotive designer. I worked with some very well-renowned people in the auto industry. I worked with Cal Shelby, and a lot of, uh, I worked on some very, very fancy sports cars at the time. But I really didn't like living in Detroit, and I wanted to get back out to California. At 27 years old, Howard decided it was time to hit the open road and head back out west on Route 66. I just get past Roswell or someplace, I can't remember, just get inside the borders of, uh, of, uh, on Route 66 on New Mexico on the, on the east side. And I, it's a cold February day, 1968. The streets are all wet. The highways, the old highways, the old Route 66. 1968, I pull up. I see this couple on the other side of the street, uh, on the other side of the highway. Uh, he's got a suitcase, the lady's got a suitcase, and a little, he's creating a little baby. And, um, and her husband is standing there next to her. And um, they looked, and I got out of the car, I went across the street with my camera and I asked them if I could take their picture. And he stood there like American Gothic. It was a really an amazing picture. And it's just, uh, I never forgot it. And I never, always, I never lost it. So when this project came up, I pulled it up and looked at it and thought, this is gonna be my opening statement when I make my presentation. So that was my first journey. And then I came into, came into Albuquerque and I drove right by the, the Highland Theater. Who knew that journey would someday lead him back to the Highland Theater? Only this time for a very different journey, the journey of creating something lasting and meaningful for all. It's really, art is really about a collaboration. It's all those resources. When you're doing public art, that's what it takes. You've got to put all these people and resources together, work as a team. It's called what I call like a virtual corporation. For the Reels and Wheels project, Howard's virtual corporation included all the people you see in this picture and more, from engineers to fabricators and workers and powder coaters and crane operators, and soon you're gonna meet them all. But first, let's get a sense of what went through the artist's head when he was getting his inspiration for the project. Public art is about making places accessible by adding enhancements, it's more than being decorative. You have to activate a space, make it engaging and, and exciting. With this project, I drove up and down 
uh, Central Avenue a good number of times and trying to, try to kind of get a sense of what the place is all about. Howard knew he wanted the piece to incorporate the nostalgia of the Route 66 era, but he also wanted it to reflect the heydays of the old Highland Theater. And I always thought that, well, it's not a movie house anymore, but it was for 50 years. And they showed movies in, on reels, and everything now is being streamed. So I thought, well, let's, let's, let's for a piece of nostalgia, which is what Route 66 is, a lot of it is all about, let's, let's see what we can do to bring that, that movie reel back into the picture. And then so, and then I thought we'll make sprockets, we'll make scale sprockets so people could sit on those and um, while they're waiting for the bus. You can almost see the reels and wheels turning in Howard's head. The movement of Route 66, the movie reels reminiscent of the bygone era of the Highland Theater. And let's not forget the neon. So I thought, well, the 66s, what can I do with these 66s to energize and make them look like they're really being driven forward? And one thing was be to, to create these oval shapes to the sixes so they look like they were moving. The other thing was to put flames out the back of these things. And they were made out of steel and they paint them in fire and fire color and, and work that out and then put LED lights on them so they'd really enhance it further. And just like that, Howard went from artist to general contractor. I may have been the originator of the thing, but I'm nothing without my my suppliers and my fabricators and my vendors who I depend on. From that point forward, Howard probably had to manage anywhere from seven to 10 people working on the project at any given time. Structural engineers, fabricators, painters, concrete guys, um, dealing with city administrators, getting per you know getting all the permits and working with NAN and so forth. So you really got all those, all those forces coming into play. Perhaps the biggest force behind the construction of the reels and wheels was someone who is no stranger to Howard Meehan's art projects, steel fabricator Phil Ortiz. I'm out here in Edgewood. I've been out here for 20 years. I'll probably be here another 20 if, if my health lets me. I'm willing to do just about any kind of work, still work, whatever needs to be done. Howard and Phil have probably done close to a dozen public art projects together, but at 15 tons of steel, this one's definitely the biggest. The thing is just, it's humongous. It's, it's a big project and uh, everybody's gonna love it. But that's not the only reason Phil says this project is more special than the others that he and Howard have done together. The reason I love this one the most, <clears throat> I'll tell you is because Everything else I've done is out of state. It's always one in, one in uh, Florida, one in Missouri, Utah, Idaho, uh, Arizona, you know. This is the first one we're doing here in Albuquerque. I've been very lucky to work with guys like Phil in particular, you know, and the powder coating guys. And I can come back and say, geez, you know, we're really, we got a real problem here. I don't, know how to, I don't know how I can make this any cheaper. Phil, can you give me some ideas? And Phil is always great at that. He'll always. And I can say, okay, why don't we do this? So we'll make the materials lighter. I'll say that we can make it. It's what I call value engineering. You go in and you sit down and you go, oh boy, this is really gonna cost too much. Suppose we did this. Howard tells me what he wants and I, I done so much work for him that he knows, I know how he thinks. Sometimes he'll draw it on a napkin and or he'll draw it on a piece of paper and he says, can we build this? And I says, I'll look at it and I say, yeah, we can build it. He loves building that stuff that I designed because then he puts it out in his yard and all the neighbors come by and say, what is that thing, you know? And so he likes the creative process. He really, we really have a good, good working relationship. On this particular day, the Iron Man, Phil Ortiz, is in his shop with his workers, putting together one of the double sixes for the Reels and Wheels project. Of course, it's gonna be a little, we rolled it a little bit tight. Of course, we do the same thing we did in the bottom. You just gotta pre-fit it, make sure everything fits nice and tight. Don't try this at home, always have a hood. We'll cut it at 93 and a quarter. Let's give it a shot here. On day two, Phil and his crew are going to attempt to move one of the 15 and a half foot steel structures out of the shop without having to take it apart, which might pose a bigger challenge than the building of the piece itself. If it doesn't come out, <laughs> cross our fingers, we'll have to cut the seam. Well, it looks like my math was okay, I guess. 
Phil may be done with fabricating the piece, but now he's got to oversee moving this mammoth monstrosity to the next phase in the process, applying the exterior finish, in this case, powder coating. Powder coating, in a sense, it's, a, it's, it's not a liquid paint. It's not a paint. A lot of people get confused on the difference between paint and powder coat. Um, powder coating is a, it's a partially cured resin. It's, it's a partially cured resin that's ground up into a, a fine powder. Um, with pigments of color and other things in it. Um, it's applied with an electrostatic spray gun. Meet Chris Damon, owner of Absolute Powder Coating. With nearly 20 years experience, Chris set up his own powder coating and sandblasting business in Albuquerque four years ago. So I've been in the industry since 1998. I'm working in uh, uh, the powder coating industry. What was it, 2012, I decided to separate from the company I was working for and open up my own business. Uh, since 2012, uh, we've done pretty large projects. One in particular is the City of Albuquerque bus stops. Um, and yeah, we've just been growing and going since 2012, and it uh, just keeps heading upward. It's been really good. It's not every day that a piece of public art shows up at his yard for powder coating, and one of this size also brings with it a number of challenges. Uh, obviously, handling time, um, safety issues with the weight, and loading after the fact with protecting the piece till it gets to its final destination, not scratching it up and damaging the, the finish that we've just put on it. But first, how about just getting it off the truck and getting it prepped for the process? And now it's ready for powder coating, which Chris says is the best coating that can be applied to steel these days. Very good impact resistance for, uh, uh, you know, scratching and, and handling and things of that nature. The first step in the preparation process is sandblasting to remove any contaminants on the surface. After sandblasting, it gets prepped, uh, goes through a prep stage and then goes into a pre-curing stage where we burn the rest of the contaminants out of the metal. After it's been through the uh, pre-bake stage there, it cools down and then goes into the powder coating booth. Powder is applied and then it goes back into the oven for curing. After curing has been done, it's been cooled down, it gets wrapped up, packaged and loaded back to the customer. In this case, the customer is the public, which brings a deeper satisfaction for Chris and his crew. Well, it's awesome, you know, we get to see the finished product when it's installed and and uh, the guys in the shop especially get a kick out of it because they get to see their work in the field. And a lot of the time, the stuff that we work on, we don't get to see that. But something that's public like this, it makes us feel good about what we do. From the time the fabrication started, the process took nearly eight months until installation day in April of 2016. And many of the key players in this process were on hand to witness history in the making. But mostly they were there to make sure that all of the pieces came together as planned and to be ready to roll with the punches and come up with a plan B if they didn't. Yeah, there's unforeseen things that come up that just we have to deal with on the spot. Anything can go wrong, you know. Murphy's Law always prevails, you know. You always have an instance where something goes crazy. One issue that came up during project construction was the fact that Howard was told that they would not be able to get any electricity out to the site where the sixes sat, so he had to figure out how. We wanted lighting. That was a really important part of the, of the project as determined by the Arts Board, and getting power out to the site was not an option. And so then we had to add solar panels to the top of the bus shelter, um, which added a whole other layer of complexity, because then we have to have a, a storage battery for that energy. The back of the real piece of the bus shelter was fabricated into a compartment to house solar batteries. We started thinking, how am I going to put those solar panels on the roof of a crown reel, movie reel, and make it look somewhat like it really belongs out there. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome everyone to the Reels and Wheels Public Art Ribbon Cutting and Block Party. When Dedication Day arrived, it was as if a part of the past had come back to meet the future. Not only was it the 90th anniversary of Route 66, along which Albuquerque was one of the notable stops, but also another very special anniversary. 
And in 2016 is the 66th anniversary of the historic Highland Theater, which is behind you. That's right. The Highland Theater first opened its doors on April 20th, 1950, just over 66 years ago to the day. We present the National Dance Institute New Mexico ABQ Celebration Team. Let's give them a round of applause. Yay! Yay! Yeah. kicks on Route 66. Public uh, art projects like this don't just happen. It takes real partnerships and we work together to make this uh, piece of art come to life. Uh, it's events like this and projects like this that bring our community together and shine the spotlight on the revitalized Highland District. We were so excited to have this piece of public art in our collection and for the city and for the county. It really speaks of the sense of place, Route 66 specifically, and also gives honor to the Highland Theater, which is a very iconic building in our city. This is a great celebration. Everybody loves this thing, you know. I mean, um, not just my work, it's just a good turnout for people to see, to embrace something, you know. Public art is about public space, and it's outdoors, and you have to embrace it. It's not in a museum, it's not on four walls, it's right here. I was really impressed. I love the silver. I mean, I love the 66 kind of coming out of the ground. And the reel is, is excellent. It's New Mexico. It's Albuquerque. It's from 66. It's perfect. The thing that I kept thinking was, all these people are here, whether they know it or not, because of public art. They might be here because they heard about it on the radio and they love old cars. Or they might be here because they have a family member who was one of the dancers with NDI. Or they might be here because they were walking up the street or taking the bus and they saw something happening. But they were all there because of this public art project. And that's what this is all about, is bringing art into the public and having that celebration and a deeper understanding of what art can be. In the end, we have this incredible product, this piece of public art that will live on um, through the ages and be an asset to our community.